Carlo Falava. I call today's subcommittee on health and technology hearing to order. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. Over the last two decades, we've seen technology change and evolve at an exponential rate. As technology has continued to advance, businesses of all sizes have adopted various forms of technology as a way to increase efficiency and decrease costs. And as this reliance on technology has become more prevalent, more and more small businesses have found that an increased use of these technological tools is necessary to allow their businesses to compete and succeed in the market. Now more than ever, every company needs a website, marketing campaigns have moved online, and the ability to accept credit or debit card payments, sometimes right on the spot, can make or break a business's bottom line. In a recent study, 80% of small businesses recognize this increased reliance on technology as a way of allowing their businesses to succeed. But they also reported that they were concerned about being able to afford and keep up with evolving technologies. Today, we will look at how the Small Business Administration's entrepreneurial development programs are serving as a resource to help businesses, small businesses develop and advance alongside this new technology. The SBA's entrepreneurial development programs include the Service Corps of Retired Executives, or SCORE, Small Business Development Centers, Women's Business Centers, and Veterans Business Outreach Centers. Each of the programs offers training and counseling to both aspiring entrepreneurs and existing small business owners on how to start, grow, and compete in the market. In order to fulfill this mission, mission, each of these entrepreneurial development programs has adapted its training and counseling programs to reflect the increased need their small business clients have for technology-based training and counseling. Given the large number of training locations and clients these programs serve, this type of program adjustment is no small task. In total, the entrepreneurial development programs have over 1,000 locations across the United States, including one in my home territory of American Samoa. They also have collectively trained more than 700,000 clients and advised or mentored more than 350,000 clients in fiscal year 2016 alone. I look forward to hearing from each of our witnesses on the progress they've made and challenges their programs continue to face as they adapt their training and counseling curricula. I now yield to Ranking Member Evans for his opening statement. Good morning and thank you, Madam Chairperson. The SBA administrates a portfolio of entrepreneurship development programs, including small business development centers, women business centers, the Service Corps of Retired Executives, or SCORE and veteran business outreach programs. These initiatives provide an inspiring entrepreneur and existing businesses with invaluable counseling, training, and technical assistance and mentorship. Whether it's creating a business plan, navigating the procurement process, marketing a new product, or identifying networking opportunities, the SBA Entrepreneurship Development Programs provide an array of services to help small business navigate regulatory obstacles grow, thrive, and most importantly, many of these services are easily accessible online. Technology has not only changed how we communicate, but also how business is conducted. It should come as no surprise that small firms are some of the savviest users of technology. They have found innovative ways to access untapped markets through low-cost voice and video conferencing. And many small businesses are utilizing social media to interact with consumers and markets themselves. The resources they use also change as technology does. The SBA Entrepreneurship Development Services must be agile enough to adapt to new technologies, but also assist small businesses in their adoption efforts. While, te while digital outreach and training is just one piece of that puzzle, it is one of the most important ones. The SBA programs are key to helping small business owners remain competitive in a global market. 
it is vital that training and counseling programs reflect the marketing increase reliance on technology. All four of the entrepreneurship development programs have already undertaken efforts to connect to their clients online by offering distant learning forms and personalized online assistance. Yet challenges remain. It is critical that as we consider ways to legislatively strengthen SBA entrepreneurship development programs, we also do with technology in mind. We must, just, we must not just look at the effect of online knowledge shared between resource partners, internally and, and external networks. This committee should also acknowledge the greater burdens prohibiting the use of technology by centers. One such challenge is a broad-based infrastructure that reaches everyone. Without investment in our infrastructure, it is inevitable that small firms in rural areas will fall behind because they lack access to the SBA resources. Poorly connected hurts the, ED, the economic development programs and the businesses. We must also look towards the development of a cybersecurity network that protects small employers trying to take advantage of digital communications and marketing. It also is protect the information conducted by uh, economic development centers. We can no longer afford to be complacent with security. That is why I have co-sponsored HR 3170, the Small Business Development Center uh, Cyber Training Act of 2017, to provide resources and tactics to assist in planning for cyber security and defending against cyber risks and cyber attacks. Today's hearing will focus on the efforts within each of the SBA programs regarding digital training and outreach. It has also given us the chance to hear about the challenges they face in developing their network and assisting small businesses adapted to rapidly changing technology. I look forward to the witnesses' insight and thank you for being here today. As you know, Madam Chair, I am sitting in for um, uh, Chairman Lawson, uh, Ranking Member Lawson, because of the Florida situation that he's down there. And yes, he's, he's in our thoughts and prayers. Thank you, Mr. Evans. If committee members have an opening statement prepared, I ask that they be submitted for the record. I'd like to take a moment to explain the timing lights for you. You will each have five minutes to deliver your testimony. The light will start out as green. When you have one minute remaining, the light will turn yellow. Finally, at the end of your five minutes, it will turn red. I ask that you try to adhere to that time limit. Our first witness is Ms. Marsha Bailey. Ms. Bailey is the founder and CEO of Women's Economic Ventures, a women's business center with locations in Santa Barbara, Santa Maria, and Ventura, California. In addition to her position with Women's Economic Ventures, Ms. Bailey also serves as the chairman of the executive committee at the Association of Women's Business Centers. Thank you for joining us today, Ms. Bailey. Our next witness is Mr. Scott Doherty. Mr. Doherty serves as the state director to the North Carolina Small Business Technology Development Centers, overseeing 14 SBDTC locations throughout the state. Mr. Doherty also serves as the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Extension, Engagement, and Economic Development at North Carolina State University. Thank you, Mr. Doherty, for being here today. Our next witness is Ms. Bridget Weston Pollock. Ms. Weston Pollock serves as the Vice President of Marketing and Communications for the SCORE Association. With 12 years of marketing experience, including eight years with the SCORE Association, Ms. Weston Pollock oversees the association's branding, marketing, public relations, and communications efforts. Thank you for being here, Ms. Weston Pollock. I now yield to our ranking member for the introduction of the final witness. Thank you again, Madam Chairperson. It is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Benton Peacock, the director of the Florida, Florida Veteran Business Outreach Center. Mr. Peacock is a business analyst who brings two decades of counseling experience to apply for his responsibility as the veteran business counselor and program director, including extensive marketing experience, well home communication skills to assist clients in various areas of business. 
He was awarded the Regional Consultant of the Year for 2014, recipient of the SBA 2014 VBOC of the Year, Regional Impact C, uh, CBA Certified Business Analyst for the year 2012, CBA of the year 2009. Since 1990, Mr. Peacock has worked in counseling, education, as instruction for college-level radio television broadcasting at the Gulf Coast Community College and teaches boots to business program at Florida military bases to retiring, separating military members. Mr. Peacock has a Bachelor of Science degree from the School of Communications and Business at Florida State University and currently a graduate student at American Military University School of Business. Welcome, Mr. Peacock. With that, Ms. Bailey, you are recognized for five minutes. You may begin. Good morning, Chairwoman Radewagen, Ranking Member Evans, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. My name is Marsha Bailey, and I'm the chair of the Association of Women's Business Centers and the founder and CEO of Women's Economic Ventures, or WEAVE, a women's business center in California. AWBC supports the network of WBCs by providing mentoring and programming to improve services to women entrepreneurs. In fact, AWBC's annual leadership conference took place this week in Alexandria. The WBC program is stronger than ever, serving 145,000 entrepreneurs last year, creating 17,000 new businesses and nearly 25,000 jobs. While not the focus of today's testimony, the AWBC is grateful to the committee for advancing legislation to modernize the WBC program and for your continued support of federal funding for women entrepreneurs. WBCs have worked to leverage advances in technology to expand our reach and ensure our entrepreneurs are prepared for a 21st century economy. WBCs view, economy from, view uh, technology from three perspectives, to enhance and promote our services, to educate entrepreneurs on how to use technology to, to manage and grow their businesses, and to operate our centers more effectively and efficiently. I want to stress that despite technology's capacity to provide options for distance learning, our clients overwhelmingly prefer in-person training because of the accountability, the camaraderie, and the support systems that are created in the classroom. And while business counseling can be delivered via Skype, it is more likely to be effective and productive if a relationship is first established between a business advisor and a client in person. Technology allows our programs to reach those who may not otherwise be able to utilize in-person services. Many WBCs serve large regions, even entire states, out of one center. Webinars and dis distance learning can fill a gap for rural areas where clients may live hundreds of miles away from a center. However, limited access to broadband in rural areas often limits the viability of such programs. WBCs have come up with some innovative solutions to this problem. The WBC at REI Oklahoma established a mobile computer lab to provide QuickBook, plan QuickBook training to clients across the, the state. Other WBCs have established stationary labs to help socially and economically disadvantaged women entrepreneurs bridge the digital divide. WBCs use technology to expand our program's reach, but we also teach entrepreneurs how to use technology in their businesses. At Weave, we bring subject matter experts into our classrooms to ensure that clients have access to the most up-to-date information, and we revise our curriculum every two years to keep up with the rapidly changing technology landscape. We've enhanced our in-person training programs by creating online assignments and tools and forming study and support groups through Facebook. We support and promote clients by posting their business milestones on our own social media pages. At the national level, AWBC has partnerships with Intuit, Constant Contact, and MasterCard to provide WBCs with free access to software and training content. Technology plays an essential role in WBC operations. CRM programs like Salesforce simplify and streamline data collection and client communication. Nearly half of the WBCs, mine included, use VistaShare's Outcome Tracker, a client database which captures intake and outcomes data. The program enables entrepreneurs to request services and access resources directly through a program portal. Business advisors can enter information into the database to document the services each client receives. 
Many WBCs are direct lenders, addressing the gap in women's access to capital. Several of us use online applications and underwriting tools, which give us more time to focus on ensuring that our borrowers are loan ready. Rapidly changing technology requires small business owners to constantly learn new skills to remain competitive. Women's business centers have often been leaders and innovators in adopting new technology to better serve the entrepreneurs who rely on us. Virtual access to services, technology training for business owners, and streamlining our administrative systems are three ways the WBC program has evolved with technology. And while technology provides many avenues to enhance our programs, I must stress that it's our people, their talent, their commitment, and their knowledge that drive the success of our programs and our small businesses. That combination of technology and talent will enable the WBC program to serve the unique needs of women entrepreneurs for years to come. Thank you for inviting me to testify today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Bailey, for your testimony. And now I'd like to welcome uh, Chairman Shabbat. Mr. Doherty, you are now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you. I thank the chair and members who are here with us today. Uh, I'm pleased to be here on behalf of my SBTDC, but also on behalf of uh, our brothers and sisters in the uh, SBDC network nationwide. The, uh, uh, the SBTDC was the first T accredited and organized state. There are now a third of the SBDCs uh, that have uh, become T accredited. Uh, we work with a whole range of companies from small startups to uh, more mature companies. Uh, it's clear that the, there are technology adoption trends in this country that are moving at almost light speed. Uh, and it's tough for smaller companies to keep up. They've got a lot of concerns. They're concerned about cost. They're concerned about security. Uh, they're concerned about how do we understand this and how does it make our business work. Uh, that's where service providers like the SBDCs and our colleagues uh, can be real important uh, as the facilitator and communicator to make decision making a little bit easier for, for our clients to, uh, to look at the best options. There, there's a big survey out. There are four levels of, uh, uh, of uh, rating in the survey from basic level of use of technology to a uh, very advanced level. This is a classic example of what a website looks like at a basic level. It's essentially a business card. There's no interactive uh, capability whatsoever. It's fine for somebody to get a telephone number and maybe an email, but it's inadequate. As you go down the chain for greater utilization of technology in the operations of your business, a couple of things happen. Those are the businesses that are growing faster than any, everybody else uh, in terms of customer count, sales count, uh, and survivability. Uh, it's the pathway for the future for all of our small companies, and they've got to uh, uh, begin to move forward in that area. Uh, the um, variety of surveys, but a couple of really telling points from all the surveys about adoption of technology is number one, it's driven by customers. It's not driven by the business. You don't make the market. You're responding to it. Uh, and that's just very true. And it's not just a, a millennial phenomena with uh, uh, people hanging out in coffee shops and never getting off their phone and this, that, and the other. People are much more intensely engaged in utilization of the Internet. Uh, so they're driving and they have expectations that their businesses uh, will be available to them online, and that includes being able to pay online. A very high percentage of people are comfortable paying online for goods and services. Uh, there are security concerns now arising, and very publicly because of the Equifax uh, phenomena, which uh, is pretty devastating. The... Um, uh, so online payments, online lending is becoming a bigger and bigger issue, and it's a concern I would raise with you. Uh, the, um, I think the bottom line to it all is that technology is moving at a much rap more rapidly increasing pace. Costs are coming down. 
but it does mean that there will be continual change in that marketplace. It's not, not like my corner restaurant that still has the 1920 cash register that they ring up. It's got brass on it. It's cute. Uh, but the, uh, uh, but that's, that's the age we live in now, and uh, all of our, our uh, businesses are going to have to adapt. As our, our SBDC has begun a couple of years ago, we are inquiring at the intake. What are your technology capabilities? What do you have? What have you looked at? What should you be thinking about in the future? And it gives us something to track now with uh, clients over a period of years. I would also say th there are three issues for you to be concerned with. One, we need to make better utilization of these networks to deliver the message required to properly train uh, our business clients on uh, the opportunities uh, and the pathways to successful uh, adoption of technology. Secondly, we need to begin to pay attention to online lending. Uh, it's, it's easy, it's simple, it's very expensive. Uh, it's not unusual to see 25% interest rate over four months. And finally, the, uh, uh, there's, there's just a lot of uncertainty about uh, cybersecurity. Uh, and somebody's going to have to take the lead, and I happen to think it might have to be Congress because of the breadth of the issue. So thank you very much, and I'm pleased to be here, and I'm happy to answer questions. <coughs> thank you for your testimony, Mr. Doherty. Ms. Weston Pollack, you are now recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Radawagen. Congressman Evans, and members of the Small Business Subcommittee on Health and Technology. My name is Bridget Weston Pollock, and I am the Vice President of Marketing and Communications for SCORE. Thank you for the opportunity to offer testimony on how technology is enhancing SCORE. First, I want to thank you for 53 years of support for SCORE. I also want to thank the United States Small Business Administration for their continued support. One of SCORE's officially stated values is that clients matter. Our client success is our success. We are proud to report that in fiscal year 2016, SCORE helped its clients to create 54,000 new businesses and add 79,000 new jobs. Technology is a major contributing factor to this success. At SCORE, we have harnessed technology to serve entrepreneurs wherever they are and however they want to be served. By paying careful attention to the feedback and data collected from these clients and from the volunteers who serve them, we continuously streamline our operations and improve our effectiveness. SCORE is utilizing technology to better serve and meet the needs of American small business owners. Strategic use of technology ensures that we remain relevant to future clients who expect us to be always open and always on. I want to tell you what small business owners are telling us they need, the true voice of the customer. A survey by SCORE showed that a quarter of small business owners ranked technology advice as most helpful to their business success. SCORE is well positioned to meet these needs, with more than 1,300 of our mentors having specific expertise in technology, a wealth of resources on the SCORE website dedicated to this topic, and additional local support from partners like SBDCs and other private sector organizations. SCORE's web strategy now makes it even easier for our clients to connect with our mentors and resources, meeting them wherever they are and however they want to be served. Our website gives clients the option of browsing our pool of mentors, filtering them by keywords, area of expertise, industry, language, and location. These mentor profiles allow clients to select the volunteers whose experience they feel most benefits them. SCORE has also developed a mentoring widget that provides quick access to SCORE mentoring and services on third-party sites. More than a dozen partners now use this, including the National Urban League, and users can connect with a SCORE mentor without ever having to leave that partner site. Our video mentoring program connects volunteers with entrepreneurs in remote locations or whose busy schedules require flexibility, using video conferencing technology such as Google Hangouts and Skype. Our data shows that video mentoring clients have the highest level of engagement, rating a 4.3 on a five-point scale, and that's compared to a 4.15 for our face-to-face -face mentoring. SCORE's robust distance learning program reaches audience members who cannot easily attend a local workshop or who prefer to learn virtually. Our live educational workshops average more than 500 attendees each week. 
Additionally, we offer more than 350 recorded webinars that are available on demand anytime on our website. In total, these workshops drew 120,000 attendees last year, and we are on track to surpass that by more than 25% this year. We also produced three virtual conferences during the past year and a half, where clients remotely participated in an online environment with the look and feel of an in-person conference. The most recent, in June of 2017, drew 3,200 live attendees, and 96.5% of those attendees told us the conference helped them. SCORE used similar technology to host our inaugural volunteer virtual conference, with 72% of SCORE chapters taking advantage of this training. Online awareness efforts are critical to fulfilling our mission, and we aim to centralize those for our chapters wherever possible. SCORE now provides websites for each chapter, which has improved chapter website traffic by more than 29% this year. SCORE also centralized social media for a third of our chapters, with those participating chapters seeing an 8.9% increase in traffic, outperforming non-participating chapters. SCORE has successfully integrated technology into every aspect of our business practices, centralizing and simplifying administrative tasks. A variety of metrics are available to help chapters and volunteers in real time so they can monitor their performance and serve clients more effectively. SCORE exists to help entrepreneurs achieve their dreams of small business success, in turn strengthening the American economy through business formation and job creation. Technology enables SCORE to be always open and always on, meeting the needs of our clients today and in the future, and serving them when and how they want to be served. I would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you again for your attention and for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Weston Pollock, for your testimony. Mr. Peacock, you are now recognized for five minutes. Good morning. I'm Brent Peacock, the director of the Veterans Business Outreach Center at Gulf Coast State College, serving the state of Florida, which is one of the largest concentrations of military bases and veterans in the U.S. The Veterans Business Outreach Centers, or VBOX, is the Small Business Administration's program that provides business counseling, training, and SBA resource partner referrals to active duty service members, National Guard and Reserve personnel, veterans, and military spouses who are interested in starting or growing a small business. The SBA funds 20 VBOX centers across the U.S. and in Hawaii. We appreciate Representative Al Lawson's invitation today to introduce you to the VBOC's mission and how we use technology to educate our core clients in the basics and best practices of business ownership and to help them succeed in today's business environment. Please review the collateral I provided for VBOC Impact. VBOC's primary mission is to conduct entrepreneurial development training dealing specifically with key issues of self-employment, meaning owning and succeeding in a business of their own. Usually service members meet the VBOC during their transition from military service in a training program called Boots to Business. This is a two-day training workshop to introduce our target audience, transitioning military, spouses, and veterans to the idea of entrepreneurship. Our second core mission is business counseling. Our business counselors and SBA resource partners, including Small Business Development Centers, SCORE, and the Women's Business Center, help our clients in assessing their entrepreneurial needs and requirements. We help them validate business concepts through extensive market research, help a viable business plan to be executed using a variety of online tools and SBA resources, help them prepare loan packages as needed, connect them with outside resources like lenders to launch and grow a successful business of their own in the civilian world. Research is an essential element of the process, and VBOX provide more than just industry-specific data. Our clients are often high-tech warriors. They're familiar with state-of-the-art technology, weapon systems, and the like, but what they don't know is how to deploy those skills in the civilian business arena. Their business concept may be what they learned in military service, but oftentimes service members choose to go in a completely unrelated field, turning their swords into proverbial plowshares. But no matter what their choice, VBOX are there to guide them through this entrepreneurial maze, from understanding the ownership options, direct ownership or a franchise, to understanding who their customers will be, what options they have in organizing and running their businesses, getting funded, and becoming operational and competitive and cash flow positive. This is our mission. Your interest is in the role technology and online business tools play in today's business arena. 
For us, it begins with the delivery of training and business counseling. VBOX, working with other SBA resource partners, can target entrepreneurial training projects and counseling sessions tailored exclusively to address the needs and concerns of the veteran entrepreneur with a wealth of online tools. VBOX help our clients identify their plan with feasibility studies, business plan assistance, reviews of financial statements, and assisting with strategic development as with such needs as identifying markets, from franchising to international marketing, from electronic sales with Square and small business record keeping like QuickBooks, to the nuances of international trade and government contracting. All of these resources are now online tools we can use every day to help your constituents and our clients. You know, not that long ago, we were limited to face-to-face -face meetings and hardcover books. But now, thanks to the rapid pace of technology and online learning, we can Skype, use webinars, and employ online resources to help our clients in a day. Technology has made a significant impact on our productivity and effectiveness as a government-funded entity. The SBA offices of Veteran Business Development maintain online access to ever-changing materials. For deployed service members who have access to, who don't have access to military installations, the Department of Defense provides Joint Knowledge Online, or JKO, for continuous career development and joint knowledge readiness for personnel, including combat commands, combat support agencies abroad. Without these, our service members may be left behind. Websites are also critical no-cost resources for our civilian and military clients. SBA.gov is a website and learning tool with a wealth of information for all aspects of business, from start to growth. It's well organized, easy to understand. It's a learning center with over 50 topics anyone can view as often as they like. Like Ville, who when she returns home from, from, Af from Afghanistan, will open that coffee shop and bakery. And spouses like Torrance, who are keeping the home fires burning and running a home-based business of their own. Both need online tools like the SBA website and ours, vboc.org the resources they need to move ahead. Websites every business owner will need to get their business off the ground from the IRS to domains for the Secretary of State's offices and local resources. Having them available electronically can help our constituents and it saves operational costs. Market research is critical and assessing the feasibility of one's idea and creating a business plan is viable today. The days of poring over books in a library are long gone Today's warriors expect access to data from their smartphone and tablets. The days of being tethered to the restraints of libraries and outdated retails are over. Like many small businesses and government agencies, from the local to the federal, we use technology to manage operations, track activities, and use this data to expand our reach and create our efficacy. Our organization uses an electronic client management system called Neocera. Through the system, we can track performance, and communicate with our clients, as well as allow them to set up their, their online training. In VBOC 2.0, the SBA's Office of Veteran Business Development promotes two new online business platforms, Live Plan and Growth Wheel. The goal is to facilitate the flow of information and track the assistance a client can receive from multiple SBA resources. Not only can we counsel the client in real time, we can share and co-counsel and track clients with our SBA resource partners. For example, if a client was referred by a VBOC to a women's business center, these platforms will allow us to track the referral and work together seamlessly to help that client. Then if the same client was referred to a lender and that referral resulted in a loan, we can track that too. I could continue, but you understand the importance of technology and online communication and how it's essential for elected officials like you and government agencies like ours to embrace it. Information and business now move at the speed of light, and technology that our nation has helped pioneer and our service members have helped to defend in the past, future, and the present will help us as entrepreneurs and warriors who are converting to entrepreneurs. I thank you for this opportunity and welcome any questions. Thank you, Mr. Peacock. I now recognize myself for five minutes of questions. There's a small business development center located at the American Samoa Community College. However, there are no women's business centers, SCORE chapter locations, or veterans business outreach centers within the territories. How are each of your programs using technology to reach clients who are located in areas without brick and mortar training locations? Ms. Bailey? 
So I will say I believe we did have a women's <coughs> business center in America and Samoa um, at one point, and um, I, I want to say that one of the challenges for some of the women's business centers has been this issue of long-term um, sustainability, and it is one of the issues that uh, the AWBC is um, uh, directly uh, addressing through a recent grant we got from um, J.P. Morgan Chase, where we're studying best practices in um, organizational uh, management and development and program delivery so that we can help those um, organizations be uh, more sustainable in the long term. I'm not personally familiar with what programs might be uh, available online to clients in American Samoa. Thank you. Mr. Doherty? Yes, thank you. Uh, we make very active use of inter interactive uh, video uh, capabilities. Uh, they're in our offices across the state, including in very rural areas of uh, North Carolina. We actually are also finalizing an arrangement with Cooperative Extension, uh, which in our state has 100 offices, one in each county, very accessible to utilize the capabilities of, of uh, that much more fully. It, it's mostly used, I might say, not for the internal intake with a client, but for the uh, relationships with specialists on staff uh, in procurement, uh, in technology, commercialization, those kinds of areas, where we have more limited staff, uh, but we can make very good use out of um, technology to interact with clients. Ms. Weston Pollock. Thank you for the question. Yes, SCORE does not have a physical presence in American Samoa, but we do feel that a number of our virtual resources can definitely fill a gap in the meantime. We have over 450 video mentors that are available through Google Hangouts and Skype. Uh, thousands of our mentors also use email and phone, so that is another way that we can communicate across the nation. With over 10,000 volunteers in this connected network, we do know that we have the ability to bring in our mentors and co-mentor or have a wealth of resources available to serve the people in American Samoa. We also have 350 online workshops that are available, and those have been highly successful. And we do have the thousands of resources on our website to help facilitate those discussions and get the people the answers that they need for whatever their business needs are. Thank you. Mr. Peacock? We provide the <coughs> boost of business training uh, to every military base, CONUS and OCONUS. And anywhere that there would be a military base, we have an actual physical presence. Uh, we cover Guam and Hawaii. And with technology, they have the access of being able to reach out to SBA websites and other resource partners to, uh, to get training and consulting. But we would like to have a, a physical presence to cover every place. Thank you. And as a follow-up, what, what type of marketing strategies are you using to ensure that people in areas without training locations near them know these programs are available? Uh, you know, I'm glad you asked that. That was uh, exactly what my next point was going to be. Many of the um, organizations um, have limited marketing budgets, and so um, if you're trying to provide services in an area where you don't have a physical presence, um, you lack that kind of word of mouth um, uh, tool that is so important to so many centers. So um, many of us do, I, I think probably all of us use um, social media for marketing, um, but we also use, you know, when you have a physical location, um, especially trying to uh, reach out to small businesses, the, the kinds of networking, in-person networking kinds of, of activities that we do are really invaluable to um, getting into that small business market. So I think probably, um, it, you know, in terms of cost effectiveness, it really is um, the online kind of marketing, but you have to know to target a community um, in order to be successful in that community. And, and frankly, a, a lot of women's business centers just don't have the budgets to do that. Mr. Doherty? I think uh, there are three primary ways to, to get reach into the communities. Number one is we're a 35-year-old program, and, and we have relationships 
in-depth relationships in communities, all 100 counties, chambers of commerce, regional economic development organizations. Uh, they have our number and uh, email address memorized. They're a great convener of small groups uh, uh, as we uh, have uh, topics they want to bring to attention. We uh, publish a lot of things that are online and in print copy uh, about issues of importance to small companies, huge distributions in state mag business magazines and uh, Chamber of Commerce publications all across the state. So it's a combination of print, online material, and personalized interaction. I might say that we have a tier system of counties. You don't want to be a tier one county in our state. It means you're at the, the bottom in terms of economics. And regrettably, we've got uh, two dozen of those. Uh, those are high impact priority counties for us. Each center that serves that region better have a lot of clients in those, cli those counties because that's where it really makes a difference. And we, we track it and score them. Ms. Weston Pollack. Thank you for the question. I think there are really two main factors to helping get the word out about SCORE and have more people use our services. Online presence is critical. We need to be where our clients and potential clients are. And we do that through social media, through our web presence, using a search engine optimization strategy. We have over 5 million visitors to our website, and that increases by at least 10% each year by adding co content that people are looking for to help their businesses. We then push that out, of course, through social media, through limited advertising, and we really do focus on geo-targeting for areas that we know can most benefit from these, or from these resources. Of course, partnerships are important as well. Like my colleagues at this table, we know that in order to reach those people, we need to form these, these partnerships and have a relationship. I mentioned our widget in our testimony, and what that does is allows partners to promote SCORE mentoring without having to really lift a finger and gets people to mentoring more quickly. We just recently formed a partnership with the U.S. Department of Agriculture to reach rural you know, entrepreneurs and farmers, and we look for more partnerships like that to spread the word to their audiences and people who can benefit from SCORE services, so we will continue to focus on that. Mr. Peacock. Well, as you know, veterans can be anywhere. And uh, no matter where they are, we provide services to them. And through the use of online media, uh, specifically Facebook, where we do provide content uh, every day, I notice that there are some uh, visitors from the American Samoan Islands, as well as everywhere else, that uh, have access to uh, contacting me if they choose to, or just reading best practices provided by the SBA or somewhere else where I get uh, content. So that makes me feel better that we're actually reaching out and if someone were to call me from uh, that particular area, I would help them. And I don't think my leadership uh, would have any trouble with that. Thank you. Now I have a question for Ms. Bailey. <clears throat> Nationally, throughout all WBCs, what are the most common training programs offered on technology? And how have these programs benefited WBC clients? So I think most of us integrate those programs, you know, into our core training programs. Um, uh, several WBCs do provide specific training workshops. They tend to be uh, longer-term training. Uh, my own program, our core training program, is a 14-week, 54-hour business planning program. So um, there's a, a large section on technology about the, you know, importance of a website, social media presence, all the things that, that we've talked about. Um, for our ongoing consulting program where we work with established businesses, um, this is continually um, part of their ongoing training. I would say um, I, the um, representatives from SCORE stated their um, their survey outcomes about the, the need for knowledge around technology, and that certainly is a big need. I would say the other um, biggest need that our clients have is really for for um, continuing education on business finance. Mr. Doherty, throughout your testimony, you discussed the importance of small businesses embracing technology in order to remain competitive and succeed in the marketplace. What current training opportunities do SBDCs and SBTDCs offer to small businesses on the various uses and forms of technology they may need to be successful? 
I've got a red light, so. <laughs> uh, the, um, what we use uh, is we, we use partner channels for outreach uh, and educational programs. Uh, we're blessed by having a 58 uh, co a community college system in our state. Uh, we have 100 counties, so a few counties are served by, uh, by the college. They do enormous amounts of continuing education and training. And we have a couple of standard products focused on uh, technology adoption, uh, opportunities and pitfalls that are routinely offered through those. So those, those are likely to be offered um, three or four times per quarter in each of the community colleges. It's a great way to, to get reach. And they are really a grassroots, community-focused uh, training resource. That's where the uh, local mom and pop uh, store is likely to go to get continuing education. They're not going to the university campus. So it gives us really good reach. Uh, and we're constantly monitoring with our own clients what's working for them so that we flavor the training opportunity with the experience of the users of the uh, training. I've got a question for Mr. Brent Peacock. In your testimony, you mentioned that an extensive technological background is common among your clients, as many of them have been trained in complex military systems. What strategies are VBOCs using to translate this knowledge and skill into beneficial business strategies? Thank you. Oftentimes, the technology that they deploy are far more advanced than anything that we're using in the civilian marketplace. Mm -hmm. But to be able to help them to understand the need for technology in their business is important and how to kind of adapt that technology to business practices. One of the things that we find with working with military members, especially those who are newly separating, is trying to slow them down and get them to focus on understanding their market and that kind of technology or that kind of uh, understanding is based on technology. To do research and find out who their customers really are and find out who their competition is. So as they come to us with uh, great technological expertise, we're very fortunate that they understand systems, that they um, can do many things uh, in, in combat that are technical. And so it's, it's not like maybe it was before. You, you know that you have a technical, technologically advanced uh, clientele and you try to meet them at, at that same level by meeting with them and speaking with them in a technologically uh, advanced way. And uh, Ms. Weston Pollock, your testimony references the score core values, one of which is experience matters. How has volunteer experience benefited your clients with regard to mentoring on technology related issues? <clears throat> Thank you for that question. We have over 10,000 volunteers that serve our clients throughout the country. And we're really proud of what we've looked at in terms of our performance and impact on the economy. One of the ways we measure how our volunteers are impacting our clients is our net promoter score. That measures how happy people are with our services and if they are willing to recommend SCORE. Last year in FY16, SCORE's NPS was 82.26, and just for context sake, 50 is considered excellent and 70 is considered world class. So we see that our volunteers are providing a high quality service to our clients. We do have a learning management system for our volunteers. They, like our clients, are interested in continuing education and learning and growing and staying on top of business trends. That system has 23 modules, and our volunteers do take advantage of that to make sure that they stay on top of the technology trends to be able to best inform and advise the clients that they see. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bailey, your testimony notes that WBCs usually share best practices related to training and counseling through the AWBC conference once a year. Are there any formal means of information sharing between centers outside of the annual conference? And as a follow-up, do you believe that formalized information sharing could benefit WBCs by minimizing duplication of efforts? 
Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to address the second part first. Um, one of the challenges with the WBC program is that every WBC is different. They really evolve to um, meet the unique needs of their own communities. And so, as you can imagine, that makes it difficult to kind of standardize the kinds of trainings. Um, regardless of that, particularly for our new WBCs or new WBC directors, we find that there is just a real thirst for um, um, curriculum, for best practices around organizational management, uh, standard operating procedures, board development, fundraising, all of those issues that are really critical to running uh, a sustainable center. So we do have, um, uh, we have a monthly newsletter in which we highlight best practices and then we have uh, on our website, we have a resource area where we um, have, um, for instance, forms and documents and um, uh, procedures that um, are free to our members to to download. So, uh, yeah, that is uh, that is a critical part in one of the things we're trying to accomplish through um, the grant that we have from J.P. Morgan Chase is is a way to to better share and replicate some of those those uh, best practices. Okay, and Mr. Doherty, as the state director of the North Carolina SBTDC system, you oversee multiple training locations throughout the state. How are best practices or successful training strategies shared within your state? And as a follow-up, beyond the North Carolina SBTDC system, what type of information sharing strategies do you use to work with other SBDCs? Well, good. Uh, our SBTDC is a pretty integrated uh, uh, system. Uh, the uh, we have, uh, we're highly interactive. We have uh, two to three major training uh, activities a year for all professional staff. Uh, we have a professional uh, development committee that monitors programs that have worked well from one reason or center to another and recommend uh, adoption of those and deployment in, uh, throughout our system. Uh, I think a, a good example of cross-sharing of ideas among states is that uh, we have a very active group of uh, states in the southeast. The state directors and, and associates meet twice a year. It's not complaining about Washington. It's not complaining about our hosts. It's entirely focused on how do we do our job better? Who's got a great program? Who's got a, a great way of reaching clients and having an impact? And that has resulted in a lot of transfer of, of programmatic ideas from one state to the other. We've also looked at that as a platform for training of our own staffs uh, regionally, uh, uh, certified economic development finance professional course. It's very intense. Uh, you need to have multiple states in order to get a big enough class. Uh, that's, that's a good, a good example of pulling together regionally. Uh, a group and it's and it's worked really well in terms of just cross fertilization on a day to day basis with your colleagues. Thank you, Miss Weston Pollock. The SCORE Association's administrative use of technology is quite extensive. Your testimony lists the use of metrics collection software, a learning management system, and client relationship management software, amongst others. How has SCORE found these forms of technology beneficial both administratively and to clients? Well, thank you for the question. They're tremendously beneficial. One, it allows us to gather more feedback and data than we ever have before. Several years ago, we did make the decision to be data-driven, and we knew that we needed to learn more from our clients to better serve them and help them have a better experience. So as we gather that data, we're able to be more nimble and agile and serve them, again, wherever they are and however they would like to be served. 
when we see that there is something in the data that's telling us they may not be as happy with our service, we can address it very quickly as opposed to waiting and you know maybe hearing about it on Facebook or something like that. We can address it right away, and that's one of the great things of having this reporting. Our reporting can also dig down to the individual volunteer level. So we can see how engaged a volunteer is, how engaged they are with each of their clients, and then gather best practices from those mentors that are performing and help those who may need some extra training. And we do regularly use those to make sure that we are continuously improving our operations. Uh, Mr. Peacock, you spoke briefly about SBA's Office of Veterans Business Development Initiative. FBOC 2, 2.0, which allows for increased flow of information between VBOCs and the other SBA ED programs to track client referrals. How is this system expected to work? Will all ED programs be required to participate? And what challenges, if any, do you anticipate with the implementation of this program given its size and scope? And how are VBOCs actively working to mitigate these issues in advance? We think that there really shouldn't be any problems. What it's going to allow, allow us to do is to provide best practices with all of our resource partners and to allow sharing. One thing about VBOX is we are centrally located. I cover the entire state of Florida. But if there's an SPDC in Orlando and a client's trying to buy a, a restaurant or something, the best uh, practice is to find counseling that's local because the best counseling is local. So maybe the SBDC or Women's Business Center score chapter might know of a realtor or a banker or somebody who knows uh, local laws and rules that we can refer to them and that way we can track all that together. As our main drive is to be there at the boots on the ground when that uh, veteran is separating to teach the Boots to Business program and also to share some of the counseling uh, duties with our resource partner network and not to create something that's already being done but to be able to share best practices um, with the other VBOX and other resource partners statewide. And the new platforms that we're introducing will allow that type of co-counseling, which I think is going to be really beneficial to tracking and keeping up with and assisting that client in the best way. And we have to remember, it really is all about that veteran, that military spouse, that active duty service member who wants to exit military service and be as productive in civilian life as he or she was in their military service. So by bringing in all the other resource partners, we're really helping them. And I think that's the, the key to what we're doing, and I think my colleagues will agree. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Bailey, uh, you discussed the importance of AWBC or WBC partnerships with outside companies such as Intuit or MasterCard as a critical way of adopting technology into training, training curricula. What does the process of establishing a partnership like this look like? And are these partnerships common among WBCs nationwide? So the partnerships that uh, um, AWBC has um, created um, benefit all of our WBCs. So for instance, with um, Intuit, they provide our WBCs with free licenses for QuickBooks and the training curriculum so that they can train their clients how to use QuickBooks. So it's a great benefit to um, all of the WBCs. Um, MasterCard uh, created a webinar called uh, Master Your Card. So it helps um, our clients, especially retail clients, who need to look at um, how to accept credit cards, how to negotiate you know, the best um, deals with merchant services and things to really kind of understand um, that whole process and the importance of it accepting credit. Um, Constant Contact, um, again, they uh, provide free email, bulk email services to all of our WBCs so that they can send out up to 10,000 free emails every uh, every month. So this is really important for um, the uh, newsletters that each of our centers do on their own as well as um, uh, the other kinds of, you know, communications and program content that, that each center uses. So we're always looking for relationships that we can negotiate on behalf of all the WBCs, because as you can imagine, many WBCs don't have access to those resources you know, in their area. So as the AWBC, if we can do that on their behalf, then that's a benefit to all. Some of them can also use some of those um, products, the value of some of those products, to, to make some of their in-kind match. 
Mr. Doherty. Uh, America's SBDC administers the peer-based national accreditation program for SBDCs on behalf of the Small Business Administration. Is there any aspect of this accreditation process that requires SBDCs to use technology administratively or to offer technological training to its clients? Good question. Uh, thank you. The accreditation process is uh, 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 an incredibly rich uh, opportunity for SBDCs to continuously improve their operations. That's really the intent. National standards, expectations with respect to uh, the type and quality of uh, services that are provided. And it's a peer-driven process, so you go through a review every five years with multiple team members looking at your, uh, at your operations against a set of standards. So it's not just coming in and saying, I don't like that, I do like this, but there's standards. The, uh, uh, what, what that process does is it oftentimes unearths really unique, interesting uh, initiatives being tried in one state that need to be replicated in other states. And those get communicated first among the accreditation committee, which is quite large, uh, uh, number of states that participate. Uh, and it gives our association opportunities then to communicate about the, some of the rich findings that are unique in there in the accreditation review process. And it's a talking point for state directors. Uh, we're committed to that process, uh, and, uh, and the best way to benefit from it is learn from what other people are doing and adopt, steal, uh, uh, replicate uh, programmatic activities. That's the American way. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Weston Pollock, the SCORE Association website offers access to numerous live and recorded webinars in addition to 50 courses on demand. What is the benefit to offering these online training opportunities? And what did the process of developing this digital training infrastructure look like? Thank you for that question. You know, it took us years to develop this, but I really do feel we have a high quality best practice webinar program in place today. When we started in 2012, we were seeing only a few hundred attendees. And as I mentioned in my testimony, we now see over 120,000 attendees who take advantage of these webinars. Some of the benefits to the clients are that many people today prefer to learn virtually. They're busy, especially business owners. They can't necessarily leave their business and attend a three-hour workshop. But they can sit there at 1 AM when their brains are going and take advantage of an on-demand webinar about a specific topic that they're interested in. So we do make sure that we cover all of those topics that they tell us they need. We survey after each webinar to ask them what other topics they would want, and then continue to hone our curriculum based on that feedback. We use mentors who have that expertise to deliver some of that content. We also have corporate partners in areas like Intuit or MasterCard that have expertise in those areas, and we ask them to be guest presenters. And then, of course, we use that as a program to cross-sell our mentoring services. And I'm pleased to say that 28% of the people in general who attend a webinar then go and seek a mentor. So we really do see it as something to reach them, get them to start thinking about whatever it is to help their business, and then to go seek out a SCORE mentor or another, um, another person who can help them in their business. We share them out through email, we, we promote them on social media, and we do leverage our relationship with the SBA to promote our webinars as well to get this great reach. And again, I'm really pleased that those who do take advantage of our webinars are highly engaged. Uh, we do an annual survey, as I mentioned, and our mentoring clients see 4.15 to 4.3 engagement, and our webinar numbers are pretty high up there as well. And Mr. Peacock. What are some examples of ways in which VBOX have used webinars or a combination of online resources and Skype or email to successfully reach clients that are not geographically located near a center? Thank you. We are allowed to uh, use Skype or telephone or other technology 
to spend hours talking with clients. We have clients who um, are interested in government contracting, for instance. And I have a colleague who has an expertise uh, basis in that. And I've seen him spend hours on either Skype or telephone just explaining the process of how to register in the system for award management, who to see, who not to see, how to uh, identify your NAICS codes, and all these kind of things like this. And he'll be doing it for half a day. And uh, that person may be in Tampa. And yet, what they learn is as valuable as if they were sitting right in their office. Um, I used to say a lot of times when I would go out and do workshops, you know, you don't have to come and see me. Those days are over. I'm not that much to look at, and our coffee's pretty good, but it's not worth your time to drive up there. I will spend the entire day on the phone with you if that's what you need, or Skype, or through a series of emails back and forth. Oftentimes, I will have an opening uh, telephone or Skype conversation to kind of introduce what they're looking for and how we can help them, and then I'll give them an assignment. Email, this is what I want you to do before the 15th of next month. You know, identify, um, let's say that they're buying a, a retail space. Identify the, uh, the price of it, have a business valuation done, and contact these three lenders, and then I'll call you back. The next month, okay, you've done that. Let's start looking at what you have to do to be operational. Get up with the Department of uh, Commerce or whatever you need to do to get the certifications and step them through. And after a while, they'll go, you know what? I'm running a business. And it's kind of funny because it's done in such incremental steps that you don't notice it. And it's the old uh, take a bite of the elephant one bite of a, at a time if you like eating elephants. And that's the best way to do it. One bite at a time so it's not so overwhelming. And one thing with, with, uh, with veterans and military people is they do have the tendency to charge and take the hill right now. And oftentimes we have to say, whoa, buddy, you can't do this by Thursday. This is going to take months. This is going to take some time, and I am going to help you. And as time goes by, as I said, they realize, we did it. And my response is, no, sir, you did it. I'm glad I was there to help. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank each of the witnesses for being here today and for the great work you do for our country's developing small businesses. It's clear that the SBA's entrepreneurial development programs are making great strides towards adapting their training and counseling programs to reflect small businesses' increased reliance on technology. This committee recognizes the challenges that each of your programs face and applauds your continued efforts to offer your clients with the resources they need to be successful. Now I ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. Without objection, so ordered. We are adjourned. Faftai telelava soifua.